Anyway, so this, this talk is really about trying to, make a, uh, trying to make a difference through human rights journalism. And I, I called it making a dime and a difference because you don't really make a dollar out of human rights journalism because you don't get very well paid, but it's kind of worth doing anyway. Um, and um, I thought I'd look at three stories that I'd done in some detail um, over my many years in journalism. I feel like a veteran, actually. Um, and uh, those three stories effectively were Rwanda, where I, I was um, in 1997 and again in 1999. Um, disability hate crime, which um, Ken just mentioned, and then um, Delphar, the Delphar eviction, and the whole story of Britain's nomads. And, What's happened since as, as the Roma people have arrived? Um, uh, well, they've been arriving for many centuries actually, but since the uh, since January the first, when the visa restrictions were lifted, um, at which are all human rights part of human rights journalism in different ways. Um, so, what is human rights journalism? Well, there's lots and lots of confusing definitions on the web, but in fact, if you type it in, you get lots of complaints about gen journalists actually abusing human rights, which I find quite uh, amusing, but essentially it's uh, journalism that upholds the 30 uh, articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, I think the one, uh, the best definition I found was the one by the International Federation of Journalists, and um, that you, you, you try and address the relationships between majorities and minorities, and you can see where that obviously addresses the issue of the Roma people, and you set standards to protect the weak against the strong, and um, you know, disabled people are perceived as weak, and certainly within the criminal justice system um, in 2007, they were certainly in a very weak position. And I think it's absolutely true that journalism, human rights journalism, should challenge structural and cultural violence. And of course, further afield, minimise direct political violence. And, and it's a really sad fact. Um, I'll come on to this one in a minute. It's very, very dangerous work. I just saw a friend of mine uh, post, uh, just uh, actually just tweet, I think four journalists, four activists and four journalists have just been found, they've just gone missing in Ukraine just in the last week. So it just shows you what happens when journalists enter conflict zones, how dangerous it is. And last year, yeah, 70 journalists were killed and about half of them um, were engaged in human rights journalism. And for media workers, that's people who work with journalists, so that's translators, um, photographers and so on, they were also killed. So it's a, it can be a dangerous business. Fortunately, nowadays, I mainly work in the UK, so it's not so dangerous. Um, this point, I, I, I think this is actually really important because I think Socrates would have been a journalist if he'd been alive today, because he talked about what philosophers should be, and he talks about them being gadflies, stealing the steed of the state. And I think that's a really interesting point. It, you know, the state should acknowledge its proper duties and obligations. And for me, that's what Private Eye does really well. It, it annoys people in a constructive way. And uh, I, I, I kind of think that's, a, that's exactly what journalists should be. Okay, so this is kind of one of my first big stories as a journalist. So I think I was on. I was an assistant producer on Panorama at this stage, and um, this is Valentina Irubigiza, and um, she was an 11-year-old girl in 1994, which is exactly 20 years ago this year, um, and she, this is the church uh, in the village where she lived, which was a village called Nyarubui, which is a, a small village 60 miles east of Kigali, which is the capital of Rwanda, and um, she, uh, uh, the 5th and 6th of April, the genocide broke out in Rwanda, and um, as you probably all know, that's the, just a typical uh, village house at that stage, so it, that was actually from 1997. Um, during the genocide in Rwanda, it's now estimated that 800,000 Tutsis uh, were killed. Now, there were two main uh, ethnic groups in Rwanda, the Tutsis and the Hutus, lots of intermarriage. It's not so well known that there also were the Twa Pygmy people. They were also murdered during the conflict, and that story really hasn't ever been uh, successfully told, uh, which I think is a pity. Um, uh, I went there in 1997, but the most dangerous time, of course, was just after the genocide, which is when Fergal Keane and lots of other very, very brave journalists went. Um, actually, just when the genocide was actually still almost ongoing, 
and they went in with the um, RPF, which was the Tutsi fighters, as they fought their way down from Uganda into Rwanda, as they were liberating parts of Rwanda, and they came across Valentina, um, who had seen her mother, her father, and all her siblings except her brother murdered in front of her in the church. And this had happened, and happened all over Rwanda, because um, uh, certain extremist Hutus uh, had encouraged people to seek sanctuary in certain places, gathered them together, and then they were they, then they were murdered, and that's exactly what happened. And I think um, several thousand people were murdered in that church you saw behind Valentina. And in fact, she'd worshipped with quite a lot of the people in that church, who then clubbed her uh, parents to death. And um, that was a very, very traumatic documentary to make, I think, for the BBC <coughs> team who made it. It was a really shocking thing to see, and um, I felt very honoured to go back there in 1997 and make a, a, another documentary that was with Panorama about the aftermath of the genocide. And I, actually, just I think one thing journalists don't do very well is aftermath, and I think we should go back a lot more than we do. Um, it was still quite dangerous when we went back because um, the Interahamwe, which is the Hutu militia, was still active in certain pockets of Rwanda. So we were sent on hostile environments courses, battlefield first aid courses. We took flat jackets with us that were so heavy that we didn't wear them. And uh, we started off kind of quite conventionally making a completely normal film about a, a genocide, which means you look for victims and perpetrators and you tell a kind of general film. And we came across one perpetrator who had incited the genocide, who was called Frodvard Karamira. And he was the only person at that stage who was, um, I think, sentenced to death for his part in the genocide and had been um, kind of grabbed by the Rwandan authorities and um, uh, put on trial there and given the death penalty because most had been sent to the Rusha War Crimes <coughs> Tribunal. And his crime was to encourage people to. Um, kill their neighbours as they did in Nyara Bue uh, through the radio. So he had done kind of um, Hutu propaganda. And in fact later it was found out that he had he was partly Tutsi, so it's kind of rather strange. Um, now I, I was asked to go into Kikali's central prison to interview him because I speak French and the reason I got that job was because I was a French speaker and um, Rwanda's a French speaking country. So that was the main reason I actually got to go to the one day, because I was just a kind of just a normal assistant producer on Panorama like anyone else. So this one skill. And um, so I was sent into Kigali Central and there were thousands of men in pink. They all had pink uniforms, bright pink uniforms, and there was this one little prison guard in orange and <laughs> he had a little stick and he went in, in front of me and he walked through waving his stick. And I was thinking, how many people have these people killed between them? because they, they just kind of parted like this wave of pink. Eventually we got through to the back and there was this man who'd incited the genocide sitting on a bunk and, uh, and he had out his hand and I thought, I really don't want to shake this man's hand. And uh, I had to shake his hand because I had to ask him for an interview, so I did. And uh, eventually he did an interview and he didn't regret anything about the genocide and he was quite happy to talk about the fact that it was fine to have done what he did. Um, and then later we went to Nyarabue and we talked to Valentina and that's when the whole film changed. At that point it was just a general film and then meeting Valentina for Fergal and for the producer Mike Robinson changed everything and it became um, a story about Valentina's story, her own individual story so she carried the film. So from being a general film it became a very specific story about one girl's human rights violations, and it actually was called Valentina's story. And he asked, Fergal asked her one question, which was what should happen to the perpetrators, thinking of this interview with this man in pink in Kigali Central. And I remember her saying, and she was only, at this stage she was 14, she said, those who killed must die themselves. And uh, it was uh, a very challenging thing to hear if you don't believe in the death penalty. And um, I found it very difficult after that because I kind of thought, well, she's seen her whole family die and I've always thought the death penalty was wrong, but surely she's the one who should judge that rather than people like me who have lived all our lives in safety 
and the rights of killers is a very inconvenient things. And in fact, Karamira, Fodvard Karamira, was executed the following year and not, I think, uh, mourned very much. And um, so that was really the first trip to Rwanda. We went back in 1999 and we went back specifically to gather evidence about, uh, this is, I was a Newsnight producer by then, uh, to gather evidence about the massacre of 25 children at a convent in Butare, which was a, a large town in, I think, the southeast of Rwanda. And the reason we've done this was because a Hutu colonel, Tassis Mubini, had taken refuge as an asylum seeker in Britain. And Fergal had read a very, very, very good and very difficult book to read, I think, called Leave Land to Tell the Story about Alison de Forge, a fantastic human rights activist. Um, where he, she had named him as being responsible for this massacre. Um, and basically, the children had been taken from the sanctuary of the convents away and then executed. So we wanted to gather evidence about this man who was claiming he was an asylum seeker. And we gathered the evidence and we visited the place where the children had been killed. And um, he was sent to the Arusha War Crimes Tribunal. So in both cases, you could say, the, you know, those, those two programs are the kind of, what we think of as, as kind of uh, the normal human rights journalism, big, big ticket human rights journalism, fully funded, ethics were really well thought out, our safety was well thought out. In fact, we travelled with a soldier with a, um, a machine gun on the first visit because it was so dangerous in our truck, which was very alarming, but probably the right thing to do. They had good outcomes in that, you know, we actually sent someone to a war crimes tribunal um, and at Valentina, a lot of people sent money to Panorama for Valentina which funded part of her education and, and some of the money went to the village as well. So that was kind of, you know, what you think of as kind of conventional human rights journalism which is now happening in Syria, in Iran, when you can get in, Central African Republic. Um, but um, there's lots of other forms of human rights journalism as well which is where we come on to kind of what I call inconvenient human rights journalism. Um, which is kind of something that I, I've thought about a lot because there's a kind of hierarchy of human rights and a hierarchy of human rights journalism. And it's unfortunate, but it is actually, I think, true that some human rights are seen as more important than other people's human rights. And I think um, human rights organisations to some extent have privileged certain people's human rights over other people's and uh, this is how, what I felt when I looked at cases of disability hate crime and how difficult it was for to get people to take them seriously. So, um, in fact, just to, you know, if you look at, say, buses, disabled people struggled for years to get and um, chain themselves to route masters and so on to get the right accessible buses and now you have problems on the buses with parents with push chairs claiming the same space that's kind of you know people think it's inconvenient to have disabled people claiming space on buses this is you know this is the kind of messy human rights that people don't like and don't like kind of talking about but it's really important because it, it matters but this particular case this was kevin davis and this case is the one where i kind of first met ken actually this was um a young man with epilepsy who was held captive in a shed in the Forest of Dean. Um, and uh, this was by his three so-called friends. And the inciting incident for this was um, that apparently he'd overturned one of the three people's uh, uh, three-wheeler car. Everyone knows that they're very easy to turn over, probably. Um, now, uh, and in fact, I, one of the points I made earlier was that a lot of the crimes in Rwanda were very playful. and. and quite disturbingly so, and I, I, when I translated testimonies later for the Rwanda survivors group, I kept on finding that as a kind of marker of, of hate crimes in, in Rwanda as well, but it really, really struck me when I found, uh, when I started looking at crimes against disabled people, this kind of freak show element to a lot of them, which was really interesting and, and disturbing. But with Kevin Davis, um, the people who attacked him, tortured him, um, starved him, recorded a hostage video, this is actually a still from the hostage video, were given really short sentences, eight and nine years in jail, which meant obviously they served around half of those. And um, I remember turning to John Pring, who was then the acting editor of Disability Now, and he's 
I think one of the best human rights journalists I actually know, and I asked him how he would characterise this crime, and he said, I think it may be a disability hate crime, and I've never ever heard anyone describe, uh, use that phrase before, but I started looking for other cases, and I found, I think, five others where people have been killed by so-called friends, and um, we published that. Um, those those cases under the under the title, if these aren't hate crimes, what are? Because we wanted people to kind of shift their understanding of hate crime, which at that stage was very much, you know, gendered hate crime, crimes, the race hate crime, um, and, and so on. So we wanted people to understand that disabled people could be attacked as well. Um, and that didn't really. <laughs> I didn't really shift anything. So the next job was to find more cases. So we took, one thing that was fantastic about Disability Now, many good things about it, was that there were lots of young disabled journalists there and they'd never worked on a big investigation before. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna put them to work on a really boring job, which was phone bashing. And um, basically divided up 43 police forces in England and Wales and looked at, um, uh, found, cases that I thought had been missed by, um, by the police forces and should have been identified as hate crimes and, and just talked to all the police press, officers, police press officers and asked them if anything would be recorded as a hate crime, asked them for details about the cases. And that was, um, that was published as the hate crime dossier, No Hiding Place, and that started to shift things. And then I think I came and interviewed you and, and you, you, you felt that there might be a pattern that had been missed. And that really helped because I felt quite encouraged that perhaps things inside the criminal justice system were shifting. And there's some fantastic people inside the Crown Prosecution Service um, who've now left. Nadine Tilbury, Joanne Perry, who's now at the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe, who I think were also bringing quite a lot of understanding from the inside as well. And I think Ken made this absolutely groundbreaking speech about disability hate crime, saying it was a scar on the face of the criminal justice system. And things really started to move then. And I think it's absolutely firmly on the map. People understand it as part of the kind of hate crime spectrum, and very few people deny it exists, but it took years for that to happen. However, I think there's still a lot to, a lot still to come. Reporting's still really low. There's lots of good work going on on social media. Uh, we, you know, we run this disability hate crime network on Facebook. There's great stuff generally um, from disabled people on social media, like Dara for Benefit Scrounger and Spartacus. But there's also a real kickback because of benefit cuts, and I think the human rights of disabled people are under threat at the moment, and they're seen as segregated from the main kind of spectrum of of human rights. And in fact, the UN stated ten years ago on. Um, how to use human rights instruments in the context of disability, that in the past the rights of these marginalised and forgotten groups have not been championed either from outside the system, by NGOs, or from within. And I, I don't think things have really changed. I think still, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, big human rights organisations who do not see disability rights as part of their work, which, whereas they do see transgender rights, um, uh, women's rights, migrant rights, absolutely as firmly as their core, core work, and I really think that that has to change. Um, just scrolling through that because we've talked about that. You know, that was that was the kind of problems that we faced at the time. These were some of the victims: Fiona Pilkington and her daughter Francesca Hardwick. And this is, uh, you know, this is the problems that we faced. But because we had Ken and other people inside the criminal justice system changing their minds, it really helped. Just um, on co-production, I, I do think that um, you know, there's a lot of talk about citizen journalism and people are very excited about it as in, in uh, newspapers at the moment. And I kind of think I'm very, very cynical about that because I think it's very much about uh, getting cheap copy and cheap videos and, and uh, it doesn't serve the general public as well as it should. I think co-production is much, much better because if you work, so I'll just explain what co-production is, so that came very much from the disability movement which has this phrase, nothing about us without us, where you work alongside people to um, elicit their stories and uh, whereas citizen journalism is the collection, dissemination and analysis of news and information by the general public. Now in that there is, there are no, there's, there's no room 
for um, educating the general public about legal problems, about ethics, or anything. In co-production, if you're working alongside people to tell their story, you can capacity build at the same time. It's a much, much better way of working. It's much more time consuming, but it actually gives people techniques that they can then go away and be journalists themselves. Fully trained, understanding ethics, understanding safety, understanding some, uh, you know, the legal implications of what they're publishing. Citizen journalism, I don't think, does that. Um, and as I said, this was old-fashioned, uh, old-fashioned journalism. Right, there's a cheerful picture. This is a horse fair. Uh, it's actually Stowe Fair, which I went to in 2010 for The Economist. Um, so, I've just written, I was writing Scapegoat, which is about disability hate crime, but at the same time I was kind of starting to look again about uh, at nomadic rights, because uh, which I'd started looking at for The Economist in 2006, because Dale Farm, which was the biggest encampment of travellers in the UK, um, was kind of nearing kind of critical legal challenges by 2010, August 2010. But I didn't want to just write about the kind of really grim stuff, because it, sometimes it gets kind of hard. So I also went to Stowe Fair to talk to English gypsies, because I also thought if you're going to write about Britain's nomads, you should go and meet some English gypsies and not just write, write about Irish travellers. And uh, I like this picture because it looks like the horse is in on the deal. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> this, this work, which I call unpopular human rights journalism, because I think people really don't want to accept that gypsies and travellers have a hard deal. All the, if you look at most, I get loads of, um, I get a Google alert on news stories on, on gypsies and travellers, gypsies and Roman travellers. And you know, they, so far this month, they've been blamed for flooding, they might gay people. <laughs> Um, at the, with the UK, flooding, fly tipping, all sorts of things. And you very, very rarely hear about the things that happen that are human rights issues against the populations, the key issues being homelessness, terrible health issues related to the contamination of sites, and racism. It, you know, it's still relatively rare that you will hear about those, those problems. Um, so the key flashpoint, obviously, was the eviction of the Dale Farm Travellers, but the book that I wrote, No Place to Call Home, was, was really looking at the history of the persecution that the Roma people on the continent and English gypsies and Irish travellers in the UK had experienced from the time that they had first arrived here. Um, and trying to kind of place some of the prejudices in a, in a larger context. And what was interesting about that was um, the Dale Farm eviction, fantastic picture, was um, this is a woman who lost her son, who was kicked to death for being a gypsy, um, was that I think, um, just going back, uh, I think you shouldn't just you know, pick a popular human rights journalism, I think you should look at unpopular human rights journalism because people like um, Mrs Delaney here, they just don't get heard otherwise or they get forgotten. and. I think they deserve to be heard. I think their, their, their concerns deserve to be heard. And the Dale Farm eviction was presented very much as a planning issue, but actually it was an issue about homelessness. And the issue of homelessness in, in the traveller, gypsy traveller population is, it, it is, is really, really bad. It's about two-fifths are, are homeless. And so every time you read about gypsies and travellers going on to a popular local park, which is obviously not a great thing to do, you've got to remember why they do it. So I, I was glad that we did that, but the, the interesting thing was that the reviews were very positive of the book and the comment boards were absolutely vehement. So I don't know what that tells you, that, you know, about um, Britain today. That was a little boy at Dale Farm after the eviction. I like that picture. It shows you just what happened. That was the bunding. Um, okay, coming to the end. This is the Roma, Roma population, Roma congregation actually, they're all Christians in Luton. And this is kind of the, one of the stories I'm doing now, and it's how do you tell a story where you know that if you give it to the traditional broadcasters, you'll get editors all over your story. So how do you actually fund a story if you don't want every line, every script line fought over? Well, what happened here was that the pastor who works with them I'd interviewed some of the families, and the pastor read the book and then said, Come back and film them. 
And I thought about it, I thought, I haven't done any filming for ages because I've been writing, but I, I do think it's a good way of telling their story. Now, as, as yet, we've, uh, I've been filming it with an ex-Newsnight colleague. We've been filming the congregation. We haven't really worked out how to fund it. We've just been going up and we've been filming the families um, on our own kit. But I think this is the kind of question you have to ask yourself is, how do you fund the new human rights journalism you know, who is going to fund it and will they interfere with your editorial line? What sources of funding are there? Do you go to crowdfunding? In fact, we've just applied for a grant because we actually thought we don't even want to do crowdfunding, we want to go for a grant. If you're going to go for conventional outlets, do you deliver it to them as a fully made film so you can avoid the tussling over every script line because it is really annoying when you feel that, you know, you've been fair. Um, so, you know, is your story actually something else? Um, but for us, that, that was the kind of story of the Roma film. We haven't really resolved it, but it's kind of, you know, it's just kind of thinking about what is your story, because I think sometimes we think the story is one thing, but that, yeah, a story can be anything now. A story can be a film, a book, Kindle single, it can be you know, something on BuzzFeed. It doesn't really matter. You've just got to think you have the nugget of the story and anything. What should I do with it and how am I going to monetize that content so I can carry on doing it? Because again, if you're going to make a difference, you've got to make a dime so you can carry on doing it. I haven't, I don't, I don't, haven't resolved it very well. With the Yemen story, um, that's a long running on a crime investigation. I've invested some of my own money, had some money from a newspaper. Uh, thought about it being going back to Panorama and making a film and eventually I've decided it's probably a book. So you kind of, you have your story and you've just got to kind of work out which way to mould the clay. But I think one of the very important things to think of is safety of all your sources. With all these stories that have got human rights implications, this Yemen story is about a young woman who was subjected to an honour crime. You have to think how do you maintain the safety of your sources because in that case quite a lot of them were under threat and for me this sums up sources this is me in Iran in 2007 and that source is actually my birth father so I was adopted he's Iranian and um, I did go and see him and I did write about it but I also protected his identity because he was imprisoned after the revolution like many other naval officers and nearly died. So, like, for me, I've got a very visceral uh, reaction to safety as a journalist, is that I kind of think about it on that level, is if it was my father, what would I want? So, that's, if you're going to take, if you're going to do human rights journalism, you have to take the safety of your sources incredibly seriously.